Okay. Next Mishnah. We're moving on from Hillel to Shammai. Okay. Shammai says three things. Aseh Torah Tchakeva. This is uh, page 41. Aseh Torah Tchakeva. Emor ma'at v'aser beh. Speak little, but do much. Receive all people with a pleasant countenance. Heavy mekabelet kol ha'adam b'sever panim yafot. Okay, so anybody who knows Shammai, was that what he was known for, for greeting everybody with a pleasant countenance? Something sound like it. Yeah, <laughs> Shammai was tough. Shammai was very tough. Um, so we have to kind of understand what he's saying here. Um, as, as is our way, we want to see if we can connect the different statements, understand them separately, and see if we can connect them as well. So let's understand the first statement here. Make the study of Torah a fixed practice. Keva. Ase, make Torah tcha, your Torah keva. What's keva? Keva can mean a lot of things. But minimally, fixed practice. What does it mean? Set time. Set time. So set time every day to learn. Yeah. What? Yeah. Like yeah. You have a traverse and you would say, hey, every night at 9 o'clock, we're going to try to study for... Yeah. So that's a simple, like that's the straightforward understanding of it. Another one, kavua, keva kavua has many different, many explanations. Keva could be the, like the central thing. Like in, when you're engaging in life, let the Torah be the keva and not the arai. Not, let it be the central thing versus like the, the peripheral. Let the Torah guide you in everything. Um, another one is um, try to make the Torah kavua inside of you. Um, when you first start out uh, learning, uh, you don't know a lot. But as you get more and more and more knowledge, um, that, ter- that knowledge follows you where you go and it guides you. They say about the Gona Vilna, who was uh, one of our greatest sages, which is called the genius. Um, in his later years, he would just sit in front of a Tanakh and just read the Tanakh. And they're, they were like, you know, Rabbi, uh, you don't have anything else to learn. You've You've been through all the Torah Kula. He's like, you don't understand. Like I'm, when I'm reading this, I see all the stuff I've learned in the Tanakh. Like I'm interpreting it in a hundred different ways, you know, based on his great knowledge. So as you grow and grow in Torah, you carry the Torah with you to more and more places and it becomes Kavua. So make the Torah, not just something you're doing from time to time, learn so much, get so much Torah inside of you that it, that it, that it guides you, that it directs you, that it, that it infiltrates your whole system. So it's really like your your kavua. It's like inside of you in a kavua way. Kavua means to be like embedded. So that could be another way to read that. Anybody have another interpretation? Sort of like uh, related to kavana. It's completely different letters, but maybe there's some sort of connection. But it's like kaf and a kuf and a vav and a bet. Well, well, but kavana means really intent and, and feeling it. And stuff. Yeah, you should have. Yeah, make the Torah to a place. Where it could be connected. Yeah, also in like a. Yeah. Um, so that's. That's something else. Speak little, do much, and receive all people with a pleasant countenance. Okay, so we offered a few interpretations to Keva. How do we connect these three statements, if we can? Speak little, but do much. Receive all people with a pleasant countenance. Anyone want to try to take a, take a stab at that? They don't have to be connected, but yeah. Something Hillel would have said, if you want to know a person who thinks something like this, don't listen to what comes out of his mouth. Watch his feet. That's what he's doing. Uh huh. So speak little, but do much. See, Hillel was. Don't talk about what you're doing. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> okay. So that's uh, a. So you're interpreting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I can offer a thought on that if anybody. Anybody. Have any other thoughts on this? On the simple, I mean, Rabbi, the last one. Look, you can. It says all people. So if yeah. you meet people, strangers, first the, the best thing you can do is smile, and then when you speak to them, talk yeah. gently. So um, I I wrote about this in the book, not here, but I think in another place. Maybe I wrote about it here. Um, I tell a story how when I first became religious, I went to mass. Did I tell you the story? When I first became religious, I was like so excited to be, I remember like I was like so, I was like kind of lost in my high school years a little bit, 11th and 12th grade. When I found Judaism, I felt like I like I was brought back to life. And I and I remember just like walking through the streets of Jerusalem, listening to music on my 
Walkman and kind of just like feeling like I was like on top of the world. So I would walk through neighborhoods. I was like, I was so happy to finally like be united with the Jewish people. I felt like I felt a sense of belonging. And I remember I was walking through a uh, mass Sharim, which is a pretty, very religious, ultra Orthodox neighborhood. And I was walking through the streets and I was smiling. I was like, Shalom. Hi everyone. <laughs> Shalom. And nobody smiled at me. <laughs> Everyone was like, who is this weirdo? But, um, but like, really, like, and I was a little bit let down by that. And I guess I, I probably came back to earth, down to earth after a while. I realized, like, not everybody is, like, always super nice. But I think uh, Shammai is trying to say, like, whenever you see people, try to give them a smile. Try to make them feel happy. Don't, don't just, like, you know, just walk by them. Well, yeah. in that particular case, or, like, your particular case, it's just a smile would have been enough. You yeah, didn't need to be was- so, you needed to speak less and just smile like let them guess why you're so happy and let it be contagious by doing that you're doing a lot so you do but you do that much why if you go into seven mile market on a friday that's no. huge. why are you picking a friday seven mile market on a friday choose uh, another because day. if i'm gonna up, say rubbish watch alone there's no we, so i would say that that's it's first of all that's this most stressed out time period uh of for religious people right, in the week um, but i'm not missing i'm not i'm not i'm not excusing it i'm not excusing it i think it's i think i think what and i think it's connected to what sandy said but, um i think he'll shamai saying you necessarily have to even like be smiling he says sever panim yafot like um give you put forward a good face so i agree with you i think that there's what to work on in religious circles we should we should Work on acknowledging what? I think it's some people might just be busy. It's very hard. That's a very busy time, Friday afternoon. At- I'm shopping with my wife's list. Dude, I'm under stress. I mean, like, I'm, I'm not excusing that. I think it's what it's as is it has the aspiration is. The table. Am I saying? Am I saying you're supposed to greet people in a favorable way? He's saying that. He should go in with maybe like a, a button, a big button or something. That says, Three smiles for shoppers. Yeah, there you go. But you know what? There's also cultural differences. Like, you know, somebody once was in the Chicago area and they walked down the street and they're, everybody's saying good Shabbos to him. But he said if he were to do that in his neighborhood, somewhere on the East Coast, um, people would look at him like he was out of his mind. It's So there's sometimes it's, it's, it's just part of the culture. So, that, I, that needs to be worked on in all areas, yeah. Um, again, I don't think that Shammai is saying that you have to make people feel uncomfortable like I might have been doing to some people in that neighborhood. <laughs> he's not saying that. But he's saying that you should you should acknowledge people. He's saying that. And Shammai was tough, too. He was a tough guy. Um, so he's still saying that, yeah. Uh, I think that it might also be a different approach to it that, you know, to attract these people in the sense like, you know, uh, some people, you know, uh, you, you, you know, teachers, you know, are saying, uh, you know, always that so many people, oh, you're not doing this one, you're doing that yeah. one, uh, uh, your hair's too long, your, yeah. your, your, your skirt's not long enough, this, that, that, that. And other people sort of have the idea of, oh, it's so great, you're doing it, it's oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, okay, you know, what's he I, saying? Well, I'm thinking that he's saying that you know you you attract people by by encouraging them as opposed to scolding them. So that's the funny thing is, is that he is actually kind of a scolder. I know he was a scolder, but maybe. So maybe we don't know Shammai as well. Maybe Shammai was tough, but uh, Shammai was tough, but maybe he was still people felt around. I mean, he still was Shammai. He still was one of our central rabbis. Like, and maybe he was still, you know, he greeted people still in in a friendly way. Although it was very tough, but I want to share like a way to connect these these three statements here, um, in in a few ways. One way would be, um, so it'd be connected to this, like make your study of Torah kavua, right? So so get it really involved in Torah, to the point that you're enmeshed in it. You're enmeshed in Torah mitzvot, good deeds, um, and that that would be speak little but do much. So do a lot to be to like chase after Torah and be involved in it. Well, while you're doing that, don't lose track of why you're doing it and why you're doing it. That's to be a better person, to be a kind person. So that could be a way to read this. Make the Torah the main thing, but don't get lost in it. Still remain a kind and a nice person. Make the Torah keva. Keep involved in, in a lot of actions. And 
still have time to greet people in a favorable way. That could be one way to connect it. Another way to be connected to this would say to expand this first one, which would be um, not just about Torah, but like the way of Torah. And this is a very important for like uh, relationships, interpersonal relationships. Now, sometimes um, you're in a connection with somebody and, um, and you might feel hurt by them, or you may feel like um, they didn't do something for you that you wanted them to do. And then you're, then you're upset and you're like, well, I'm not going to do anything for them. or I'm not going to help them in this way or the other. Um, that sometimes is a healthy boundary, but sometimes it can be un, like not helpful for the relationship. Sometimes uh, you need to kind of remember what the right thing is to do. The right thing is to, to try to be a good person and to like try to elevate yourself above um, the petty things. So it could be saying that here. Make your study of Torah fixed practice. Make, make the Torah your guide. Not, oh, what's this? Is this person deserving of my kindness or not? How did they act the other day? I'm going to get them back. What's the right thing to do? Be a good person. Be kind. Let the Torah be the, the central thing that's guiding you. Speak little, but do much. Be, be involved. Don't get involved in like, oh, they didn't. Don't have all those voices. Put them aside and do much. Do the good acts. And if you do that, sometimes when you do that, you might still be holding on to a little bit of resentment. You might do the kind of act, but you might do it in anger. So it's saying while you're doing it, try your best to still do it with a good face. So basically it's pushing back against three ways of thinking. One would be, um, I'm just going to, I'm not going to give to this person and be nice because I don't want to. No, follow the Torah. The Torah would say, be kind, try your best. And then you might say, well, uh, I'm going to uh, just give them a little. No, do it the way you're supposed to do it. Be a kind person, do the right deed in the right way. Okay, I'll do the right deed in the right way. Fine. But I'm not going to do it happily. They're, they're going to know that I'm not happy to do it. I'm going to throw the food on the table, whatever. No, still try to do it with sever panim yafot. So it could be, a, again, this direction isn't always, isn't always a healthy way to do it if you're in like a, a very imbalanced relationship. But, but it is good guidance to remember. We're supposed to be trying to do the right thing, especially um, Kibbutz Ava M, uh, respecting your parents is a good test of this. Like, you know, um, the Torah says, uh, you know, you have to respect your parents. It doesn't say you have to love your parents. It says you have to respect your parents. We have to put it forward actions uh, that show respect. And why? Because that's the right thing to do. You do it. And uh, so you do it. You try to give to them because that's the right thing to do. And you try to do it, not show them that you're upset in doing it. And so that could be like a, a way to connect the three statements. I saw Sherry. Yeah. So I, I kind of took it a little bit differently mm -hmm. that that you learn Torah and you, you incorporate it into your life and, and you teach by living it. And then by doing that, you, you receive all people with pleasant countenance that you don't, that you don't become judgmental and you, you only by your being open Will other people learn from you? I like that a lot. That's really good. Yeah. I, I looked at it completely different as not just individual people, but we as the Jewish people need, need to learn Torah. And the practice is then to go to other nations and, you know, show them what. Because uh, it does say receive all people. And then, and then, right. So that's what I was thinking all people to mean hmm. nations and not only others. Uh, no, one more. What? No, I'm sorry. Um, here's one. Yeah, for one more interpretation, and we'll move on. Um, another interpretation. Of all these three. I think it's also can fit really nicely into the language. Um, there are two types of people that um, there's somebody who shows you that they're special, um, but they kind of feel insecure, and there's somebody who feels who is special. They they feel secure about them. They don't need to show you it all the time. Happens with finance. It happens in in education. It happens all over the place. Like I think this Mishnah could be saying um, that we should choose the latter. Meaning, make the study of Torah, um, make the ways of the Torah so embedded in you um, that um, that you don't need to uh, show off to other people. You don't need to speak about yourself. Um, you speak little, but you do much. Like be secure uh, with who you are. That you don't need to always show people how special you are, but rather you do a lot and you do the right thing. And then um, if you're really in a good place, um, you'll be able to treat everybody properly as opposed to 
um, you looking for them to praise you, you be able to greet them, be kind to them. So if you're really doing things, I guess for the right reason, you're doing it because you, you feel very connected to Torah and you feel like you're in a secure place. Uh, you'll be able to do things without speaking much about yourself. You'll be able to just be a good person. And you'll also be, a, be able to be kind and have extra blessing to give to other people. So I had to kind of work a little bit more into the words there, but I think that that works out. Yeah. You put it a little differently. Um, number one is, is Torah, and that hopefully grounds you to be able to do number two and three. If you're grounded in Torah, yeah. you then have the ability to do number two and three. If you have ground in Torah, you can speak little and do much. And you, yeah, yeah. If you're grounded in Torah and you're doing it the right way, you have real humility, and you don't need to always keep talking and showing off. But you'll just be doing. You'll be doing the right thing because it's the right thing. And then also, you'll be able to really be nice to people because you feel confident and secure, and you feel good with your life. Yeah. And what I'm saying is, it really gives you the bill and correct. Do it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Last and then we'll just move on. So, um, I've studied uh, Ralph Cordovero. And he said that you learn, you can learn something from every single person. So if you're talking, you, you're not listening. So if you could learn something from everyone, it, maybe you can learn Torah from everyone. But if you're talking, you wouldn't know. So that brings us to the next Mishnah. Uh, actually, the Mishnah after this. But the next Mishnah after this talks exactly about that. So let's try to, let's, let's see if we can get there. Um, all right. The next Mishnah is 116. Okay. Um, this Mishnah speaks about, uh, make yourself a rabbi, avoid doubt and do not make a habit of tithing by guesswork. Okay. Um, so what's the main message of this Mishnah? Let me see. Let me ask somebody on zoom. Actually, what's the main message of this Mishnah? And to be on zoom, want to take a, take a chat, take a guess. Oh, I'm not even showing it to you, so you're not. <laughs> All right, what about here? What's the message of this Mishnah? What I was to take away, I think it's easy to connect the three teachings here. Have more than one rabbi. Okay, so you want to explain? Well, in the sense that it depends on different things in your life. You might, uh, rabbis can be, have different outlooks uh, as far as, you know, like parts of the different, so how do you see that in the words here? How do you see that in the words here? Uh, so make yourself a rabbi. Well, I'm reading for the... It doesn't say make yourself. It says a point. A point. That's it actually right. says make. A selacha. O se. A point could be make make yourself a rabbi. Put hmm. a rabbi for yourself. So you can read like that. Make yourself a rabbi, meaning like making... You can make, you can make a rabbi. You can make things. Um, it's perfectly... So this... There's two topics I want to talk about here. One is like um, um, relationships between us and rabbis. Why we need a rabbi? Uh, why? And if you if you only have to if you can only have one rabbi, you can multiple rabbis. It's one topic to talk about. Another topic to talk about, which I'll just talk about that one first. I think this Mishnah is speaking about um, like being careful of like not living a life based on guesswork. Um, so there's a halacha where you can make the same. If you make shahakol on any food, it counts. Meaning, if you take bread, you say shahakol ni ebivaro, you can eat the food. Shahakol ni ebivaro, God, in, with everything that was created with God's word. Any food, for fruit, for benzonas, for whatever. But you're not really supposed to rely on that. You're supposed to learn the laws and know which specific blessing applies to which specific food. And I think a lot of times in our religious lives, uh, we kind of cut corners. We're just like, ah, you know... Uh, most likely this is the answer, or I can rely on that view, or um, Shackle covers everything. I think this mission is saying like, don't cut corners, like, you know, uh, take it seriously. Uh, look it up, investigate, find yourself a rabbi, get rid of the doubts. Don't work with gu guesswork when you're dealing with tithe. Get the specific, tithing needs to be a 10. Figure out the details. Again, it's not saying like when you're on your path of learning, you, you, sometimes you need to rely on guesswork, but it's saying that's not the final destination. Take it seriously. I don't know. People um, people who come uh, to convert, we help people convert from time to time. Um, I'm not I'm not so easy with them. Like I'm saying, I, I like if you're going to go to university and you're going to get a degree, you're probably going to learn. Take many tests. You're going to learn in a very thorough way. I want you to learn Judaism in a thorough way. And then, you know, we'll bring you in. Similarly, like we need to be serious about 
Yiddishkeit. We need to like uh, take it seriously. If we think it's important, I think it's serious. Just like we're, I don't know. I don't know if you're the type of personality. You know who you are if you know this is true. Are you that type of personality that on Amazon you look through all the customer reviews and you go and you you look at, uh, you read like all the, you compare multiple products before you go. Some people do that. Some people don't. But that type of personality, we need to do that with Judaism too. We need to compare approaches. We need to really investigate so that we get the best product. We want to get the best product. Okay, We don't want to get one with just one star. We want to get something with five stars with 10,000 people who rated it. Okay, that's what we want from Judaism. Yeah. I think also that no, no one knows it all. Like rabbis have rabbis. Yeah. So that there's always someone out there who knows more than we do about a topic. So find someone that you can, even though you know a lot, that you can continue to learn from. Yeah. yeah. Correct. You you yeah. have to know. Yeah. You have to know. I, I, you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, I, Mark. I think this could be so, um it could be um, summarized in two words, due diligence. You know, if, if you're serious about something, you're going to be diligent um, about getting the right answer. It's not sloppy. It's, you know, trying to get certainty. And that's what due diligence is. And this is all due diligence. You right. have a religious matter, you're uncertain, get an authority. Don't be uncertain about it. And, uh, you know, and, and the same is, is true for the last sentence. I want to show you something, okay? Anybody ever use ChatGPT? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. ChatGPT, this is our artificial intelligence. Let's see. Let's have it tell us how to understand this Mishnah. Okay. Um, explain the Mishnah in Avot with Shammai um, saying, make yourself... A rabbi. <laughs> okay. Okay. So these days you can plug anything into Google and a chat GPT and get answers. So that's a second topic I want to address. With all this information now we have, why do we even need rabbis? I'm serious about that. I write about it in my book. I'll tell you why. Okay. This is information. Rabbis will give you wisdom. This is not wisdom? What? It's what? Hallucination? So you get out of hallucination? Remove yeah, yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It just finds random facts and it could be wrong. So I mean, so okay. Let's say this is all fact check. You can Google today from a lot of questions. You can Google your questions. So why do we need rabbis? It's the mission is saying, "I said the Get a rabbi. Uh, what and why? Why? Why do we need a rabbi? Yeah. You can hold the rabbi responsible for what he's teaching you. AI, you don't know who is responsible, who's behind. Well, they give you the links, look. Well, they give you the links, but I'm just saying is- But they don't give you the personal connection. You're, if you don't have your rabbi and you're just reading off of uh, off Google, you're lacking the interpersonal connection. Correct. Um, so that's one, val one benefit of having a rabbi. I think also like, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Part of personal development is to have a role model, and yeah, you you you, need, you should have your rabbi for a little bit more than the answers he's going to give you. It's the role model that he's providing for you to em emulate how he, how he lives his life, or she lives her life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, they can't, they can't see of you. I guess another yeah. A rabbi in the twelfth century. So is that a role model again? It would be different than a rabbi in the 18th century and a rabbi in the 21st century. So rabbis in each generation. Rabbis are generationally evolving as well. Okay, so how's that? So why is that? ChatGPT is very futuristic. ChatGPT changes every time 
You, if you put the same thing in, you'll get something else. If you ask if me the same thing, I probably will say, tell you different answers each time too. Try it. Yeah. What, wait, wait, what answer is no. that? Right. I don't give you. Okay. That's a good question. Yeah. One sec. Let's finish that. So wait, wait. Well, that's a, what you just made was a good point. And maybe not in the way you meant it, but in my mind. The reason you go to you get a real a rabbi and not go on the internet because I also can get it. I, I I've Googled like when I can't think of something really quick how I should approach something a lot of it. I might do that, but I have my rabbinic source that I go to. My rabbinic, huh? No, no, my son. <laughs> Keith. Anyway, but um, but but the fact is, my rabbi. And my rabbis here know me. And that's how the answer changes. Yes. The answer changes not because the information changes. The answer changes because of who's asking the question. Yeah. And that's the difference between using a computer and going to and having a real live so, person. But is it that? Okay, one, one second. Um, I want to. So that's a, there are multiple ways you can read this, but that's another way to read this. Go, find yourself a rabbi and remove yourself from doubt. You need to find the rabbi who's going to help satisfy your doubts. Meaning not every rabbi is going to speak to you the same way. Some rabbis, you might ask a question and you still feel wanting. You feel like they're not really speaking to you. So I think that's kind of connected to what you're saying. Uh, remove but, your and I also want to add that you can't, you, you find yourself a rabbi, then don't go shopping. Yet. <laughs> don't go shopping. Okay. Because don't go shopping for the answer you're looking for. If you have found or you appoint yourself or make yourself a rabbi, then um, you have to, you know, you buy the whole package. You yeah. have to go to whatever. So, and it could also make, when it says here, make yourself, because it's a reflective noun here, um, a verb. If, if you make yourself a rabbi, it could also mean you yourself should have greater knowledge. Yeah, yeah so I kind of wrote about that in here where I said, make turn, you can at times make yourself a rabbi. It doesn't mean, I mean if you want to, what? That's, that's where the, the artificial intelligence might help. <laughs> well, the thing is, yeah. So and I was saying that's fine, but you also need some sort of connection with, yeah, beyond that. Um, so I saw another hand. Uh, was that, was that, all right, did I cut you off, Ed? Okay. Um, so I think this Mishnah could be read that way in terms of guesswork. Be serious, be diligent, like Mark said. Um, I think we could also, it also could be overall speaking about the value of a rabbi, I think the rabbi helps you avoid doubt. Now, doubt can be just practical halacha. Like, I need to know what to do. And really, um, I don't know, like, you can you can um, sell your house on your own, but it's helpful many times to find a real estate agent because they know the market. They know they know what's going on. Rabbi's been through books for 10, 15, 20 years. You know, it's you can just Google, but you won't really know all the time, like, what the intricacies of Jewish law are. Um, similarly, I think that a rabbi can remove you from doubt in terms of like um, helping you connect more to Hashem, helping you feel more certainty in, in your Abu Dhabi Hashem. Um, and another way a rabbi can remove one from doubt um, is connected to, to tradition. I used to follow uh, rabbis around um, and just kind of watch how they lived. I wanted to like see how they lived and because they watched their rabbis and saw how their rabbis lived and kind of just connect to a tradition. And if we don't have a tradition, um, we're a little bit in doubt in the sense like we're not connected to something secure and solid and stable. And so the more you're around rabbis, you can open up ChatGPT and Google and get information, but it's nothing like the live a lived experience with, with rabbis, with people who are, who've been around other rabbis, around other rabbis, and it brings you all the way back. So you need something lived that can, can really connect you. It can embellish, they can embellish information and you can embellish embellish knowledge that you can't get. Yeah. Yeah. So is that, is that a singular rabbi or can you have many rabbis? So, make yourself a so, rabbi, so I wrote about that here. I personally think you, I think you can have rabbis for specific things, but you should be consistent. Like don't, it's like not fair to the rabbi. Like you call the rabbi, go, one second, I'm going to go talk to the other rabbi. Like the rabbi, like put in time, invested it to answer your question. Like, be, be honest and go, but you don't have to go to the same rabbi for everything. Like um, I have a rabbi I speak to about personal matters. He's not as strong in Jewish law. I go to another rabbi when it comes to topics of Jewish law. So you can have different rabbis for different functions. And I think the mission is saying when it says that can remove you from doubt, 
find the rabbi that really removes you from doubt. Like you can go to a rabbi and ask a question. You feel like the rabbi did not understand you at all. Or the rabbi is speaking to you, um, but he's not really answering based on your situation. You're still in doubt. You still feel like not secure in the answer. Find a rabbi that's going to give you a sense of security. But once you find that, then you should follow that rabbi and their guidance. But you can have a rabbi for different things. Like there's certain rabbis who are like experts in Gittin, like laws of Gittin. So we don't always, we ask those rabbis questions in the laws of, of um, divorce. It's a rare topic that you need a lot of knowledge in. So we go to experts, it's fine. But but don't, the idea of shopping around is real. Yeah, find somebody, the, you can avoid shopping around if you find the rabbi that's gonna remove those doubts from you. He really knows how to speak to your soul. Okay, so that's, I think, what the mission is. And he could be, and this, I have a personal example where I asked my son a halakhic question, and he didn't know the answer to it, and he went to the group of rabbis he discusses those things with, yeah. and then was able to come back and explain to me the answer and why. And uh, so that you, the person you're appointing your rabbi could also be somebody you know who will look to the right sources when he, he needs he or, he needs help or she needs help, as Ted would say, to find that answer. Hundred percent. Um, just seeing, I added a few more notes here. It's a WhatsApp group. <laughs> um, one more thing is um, there's a tendency uh, sometimes when you're in doubt to be stringent. Um, meaning like if you don't, it happens a lot around Passover time where people will come and they'll ask me all these questions around things that they've been doing for years. And I, and I, and they start asking on the premise, like, that's a thing. I don't know, like to take to, to extreme cleaning the walls or something like that on, on go heading into Pesach. Ms. Shulchan Aruch does say that there was a custom people used to clean their walls, but you don't have to clean your walls to get rid of chametz. You're not eating any chametz there. You're not going to see a large amount of, uh, but somebody might come up to you and be like, you know, Rabbi, what, what chemical should I clean my walls or something for Passover? And so uh, a lot of times it comes from, it'll come from, ignor come, so it'll come from ignorance or whatever, it'll come from like, sometimes we don't know and we live a life based on guesswork and I think the Torah uh, wants to remove us from that and wants to let us live like a, a like a live hell in a healthy way. Like sometimes not asking a rabbi, not appointing a rabbi can make your life more difficult, actually, because <laughs> you end up doing things by guesswork. You become a little bit too strict. And so it's really good to know when you need to be strict and when you're allowed to be lenient. And when you're allowed to be lenient, um, that's you should embrace it because that's OK. Like, you know. Yeah, but what happens when you've checked with the rabbi? I remember this situation once when my wife was asking one about something for Pesach and he, you know, about something with the countertops or whatever. And he says, it's okay to do that. Like, clean it this way or whatever. Then you read it somewhere else. Right? But then he, she said to him, well, but, but what's your wife do? And he says, well, that's another story. It, 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 yeah, it's fine. It's I mean, beyond... So good. I'm happy you brought that up. To my point was he was answering for her. He right. wasn't answering for himself. Right. And that's I mean, why... I though it's permissible to, to clean it this way, it wasn't enough, say, so, for his wife, and she's got to go beyond me. So good. This is a really good segue. I want to share the story and then um, move to the next Mishnah. But this is a great story of Mar Mordechai's Etrog. Mar Mordechai Liao was a rabbi uh, I grew up with uh, in Jerusalem, once I became religious at age 18, I lived like at a certain point down the street from him. He was once the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel. Um, and he, uh, there was this young boy, this is a 100% true story. Was, and I tell, as I wrote this, this, I can send it to you, whatever. It's, um, it's Google it, Rabbi Eliyahu's Etrog for the full version. But um, Rabbi, there was a student who, uh, a young man who learned, a young boy who learned around Bar Mitzvah age, he learned about um, laws of Etrog and he wanted uh, like a beautiful Etrog. Just have as beautiful of an etrog as possible. Um, so he went and he bought this etrog. He went to the shuk. He looked all around. He found the etrog, a beautiful etrog in his eyes. And he brought it to Rabbi Mordechai Liao. And, um, and he says, uh, Rabbi Mordechai, is this a kosher etrog? Is this a beautiful etrog? It's a beautiful etrog. And, uh, and Rabbi Mordechai says, it's kosher. It's kosher. He goes, it's a beautiful etrog. He goes, it's kosher. It's kosher. And the young boy took the etrog and he left and he was crying. And, uh, and Rabbi Mordechai sent somebody to go chase after him, to bring him back. And he, and he brought uh, the young boy back. 
And the Ramarcha went into his like cabinet and he took out his etrog, which is probably a very beautiful etrog. The etrogs can cost a lot of money, like up to like hundreds of hundreds of dollars. And so he took out, gave him his etrog, Ramarcha's etrog, and the young boy uh, took that and left Ramarcha, took his etrog. Um, so the young boy was so happy, he was ecstatic. Like he was like, he has the most beautiful etrog in town. Uh, even though Ramarcha said his other one was kasher, kosher, this is the beautiful etrog. Um, so the next day he comes to Netzmanya in the morning early, or Marcha used to down very early um, with the sunrise. And he brought his Sukkot, he brought his Lulav, he brought his Etrog, um, Marcha, the beautiful Etrog. And he looks up and he's like excited to see Ramarcha, like, you know, which kind of Etrog he's going to be. We got another new one. Turns out Ramarcha took out um, the boy's Etrog and he was davening with the boy's Etrog uh, throughout all of davening. And so the question is, why did he take out the boy's Etrog? He could have easily accessed other etrogs. So one explanation for that is Rabbi Morachai wanted to make a statement. Like if it's the rabbi says it's kosher, it's kosher. And you have to follow what the rabbi says. Like you don't have to like, maybe it's not, um, you're looking for beautiful, the most beautiful thing. It's kosher. So Rabbi Morachai, he says, if it's kosher for me to tell you, it's kosher enough for me. That's one explanation. Um, another explanation, <clears throat> which I heard from Rabbi Huva Albrecht, um, she said that, um, the, yeah, she said that Rabbi Morachai, it's like a really Hasidic spin on it. Amor Eliyahu thought that this etrog was even more beautiful because this etrog came from the boy who learned all the laws and he wanted to find the most beautiful etrog. So he found this beautiful etrog. So he's like, I want that one. It's even more beautiful than this one. But what I'm trying to show is that Amor seemed the simple understanding is that Amor was trying to show that like when the halacha is the halacha, the rabbi is not messing around. The rabbi might take on extra stringencies upon themselves and their wives might as well. But if they're going to say it's kosher, the bottom line is they're not going to lie. At the bottom line, is it's kosher. Ramar Chai wanted to like emphasize that uh, through that story. So there's a few other interpretations to that, but um, that kind of that that, ten, that answers, I think, what you're saying. Um, well, we, say, we say in our house, our key. This is a key quote. It's hard to be from. It's easier to be frommer. Mm. Yeah. It's very easy. It's very easy to say something's forbidden. It's very hard to say something's permitted. Some people, it's easy to say things are permitted, but I'm saying in a real way, yeah. not like not just like cutting corners. Like, like there's a lot of peer pressure to be stringent nowadays. But um, if you look through any of the tshuvas, the law, um, shelova tshuva, the response of rabbis over the generations, some rabbis are very they were very strict on certain things, but they were also lenient on other things. What well, guided the rabbis wasn't like what people were saying a lot of time, or if they would be accepted. They were trying to figure out what the what what the truth was. Sometimes it came out very lenient. Rav Avadi Yosef uh, Paskin very lenient in a lot of areas. He was very strict in a lot of areas as well. Rav, Rav Moshe Feinstein very strict in a lot of areas, and also he's lenient in other areas. So it's really about like trying to trying to work hard to find out what the truth is. And sometimes that'll come out lenient, sometimes it'll come out stringent. Um, but it's but it's not okay to make your whole religious lifestyle based on stringencies because you don't know better. You don't know better. That's not okay. You should figure out what the law is. And if the law says it's okay, it's okay. And that's fine. I think that's what Rav Morachai was trying to show with that story. Okay. Um, let's go on to the next mission. The next mission is, Shimon and his son used to say, all my days I grew up among the sages. And I found nothing better for a person, for the body, than silence. It's interesting. It says, Loma Tati Tov, La goof. It's an interesting language. Goof means body. I never found something better for the body than silence. It's very interesting. It could just be saying for the individual, but it's weird that it's saying, it stands out that it's saying goof, the body. Okay. Um, so he says, uh, study is not the most important thing, but actions. Whoever indulges in too many words brings about sin. Okay, so this is, Jenna, this is kind of connected to your speech. I uh, can withhold you from hearing what other people are saying, right? Seems to be that that's like the simple, um, simple explanation. I try to go through these this this mission. What's the mission about? <clears throat> yeah, Ed. I'll just say it's simple. The wisest of all kings was King Solomon, and there is nothing better than silence. And if you want a small antidote, I use it. I'm not going to say how many times I use it, but I use it to increase the show and bias in my house. If there is discourse on a matter, person A thinks this, person 
be thinks this, and I get quiet. You know my wife, Sheila. Oh, Ruth Hashem, I love her. She'll say, are you going King Solomon on me? And I'll just look at her and I'll go, that's it. So maybe cooler heads need to prevail. Maybe I don't want to say anything. Okay. Where is she today? Uh, 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 but I'm being serious. Yeah, I hear that. I, I think it's saying the main focus of this Mishnah is seems to be silence or staying silent or the value of 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 not speaking, a withholding. Another cache. What would we say? Guard our tongue. Guard, guard your tongue. Yeah. Um. So one way to understand this is say that it's three statements about like speaking. One is uh, sometimes three, if you're speaking too much in certain contexts can be negative. So when you're around people who are smart, who know a lot, who can guide you and direct you, like Janet said, it's worth listening to them. to so hearing, hearing what they have to say. So I've been around wise people all my, I grew up around wise people. If you're around wise people, make space to hear uh, what they have to share. The next one is study is not the most important things, but action. Sometimes when you're speaking a lot um, or you're involved in discourse around things, it withholds you from doing things. You know, you talk about doing things that can withhold you from doing things. So it's about knowledge, mass knowledge about action. And the final one is sometimes when you're speaking a lot, you can do sins with your speech. You can speak bad things about people. You can, you know, speak gossip. So all like negative sides of too much speech, uh, speech. That's one way to read it. Um, another way to read this, which I offered in the book, which is a very creative reading. This is like, this might, you might feel this is a little too creative, Sandy, but um, this reading, basically the verse, the, the, the language says, Lo matzati tov laguf I only found nothing better for a person than silence. Another way that it's read in Tiferi Yisrael is, I never found anything for the goof, better for the person um, um, I so he basically reads like this. I've never found something for the person that's good if you remain only in silence. Meaning it's the exact opposite. It's not good for the person to remain elabishtika, only in silence. Sometimes you need to speak up. It's the exact opposite reading. Um, it could be speaking, I'm applying this to a certain context when you're around very wise people. Sometimes you're around very wise people. It happens in politics, it happens in, in organizations and they just don't wanna solve issues. They just want to speak. It happens in committees a lot of times, a lot of committees where it's just speaking about doing things. And sometimes uh, bad can come out of that because you're actually not solving the problem. So it could be saying the first piece, sometimes when you're around wise people, it's not good to be only silent. You need to speak up if something's wrong. Do not let them only turn into theoretical discussions. Make it about action. Study is not the most important thing. The theoretical discussions aren't the most important thing. It's about actions, making things better. And sometimes when you speak and speak and speak about problems, but you don't solve them, that can lead to even more sin, more bad things. You have a problem that needs to be solved. You get around wise people. They start telling you all these explanations. They start discussing things. We should have a, we should have a follow-up discussion on that. And we should follow up a discussion on that. No, speak up. That's not okay. We need to solve this. We need to focus on not just studying, but actions. And if we don't do that, then what's going to happen? The sin will proliferate. These bad things that we're supposed to be here solving, we're not going to solve them. It's going to get even worse. I think it's like a good, good pushback against uh, many, many committees and meetings I've been in where they're just it's like talking around in circles that they don't actually make things better. We should be focused on actions, not just speech. Speech. Yeah. Well, this is exactly what you're saying. It is pleasure. But I'm thinking about last week. Can you talk about Hillel? And why he said and not uh, and and not now when it was you know it was to take what he was saying you know, the Torah and put it into action he had, he had spoken yeah. enough and now he's going to now take it away yes so that's what we're saying right. yeah um, correct I would add to like obviously you need you can't just like uh, you need you need to have process and everything like that but a lot gets lost in the process sometimes it just goes around you end up. And, and, and people are suffering in the world. People are suffering in the community. You know, people need answers. It's a sin. That thing is talking about the sin, the bad things. The bad things are there. 
and they, they'll keep happening if we don't find a way to address them. So I think it might be talking about that. If it, it, I, I have a question. I, yeah, well, uh, Mark, one second. Uh, yeah. And then we'll. Kimo Bono is the son of uh, Rabban Gamliel, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what were you going to say, Mark? Yeah, you know, relative to trying to, you know, weave this all together, um, where you have, you know, the, the focus is on action. Uh, on the first one, I mean, could it be saying, look, if you don't have something constructive and something useful to say, just keep quiet. Yes. Okay. It could be saying that for sure. Do you want to, is that, and then what's the rest? Well, and then, you know, this is, um, th th this whole M Mishnah is, is, is really about actions. And mm -hmm. So and being constructive, I, I guess. And you know, if if you can't say anything intelligent, keep quiet. Um, mm -hmm. If you can't say anything that's going to lead to any actions, keep quiet. So that's how I read this. Um, another thought on this: um, when I first became more observant, I uh, had this stage where I was like, I wanted um, like a hundred percent proof that the Torah was true. Like I, I had this stage where I was like, I want to be proven to me. And I would go to like programs of like where they prove things, you know, um, I never got it proven to me a hundred percent. Sorry. I, I don't know if that, um, but, but I was going through it the wrong way at the time. Um, what really proved it, the truth and the, like the authenticity and the, like the, what really connected to me to Yiddishkeit was um, being involved in actions um, spending time at Shabbos tables, uh, being around my grandparents. Um, that really just felt, it felt right for me. It felt true. And I, of course, I think there's good evidence in the Torah for it being true. And that supports that. Um, but I think what's saying here, um, especially in your early years, when you're growing up, when you're growing up, growing up among sages, you're growing up, you're around, um, influences, um, sometimes, uh, in the body, your body and your, your lusts and your drives are like very strong. Uh, sometimes uh, you trying to seek out answers philosophically um, that might not be as strong. Sometimes you need like a versus you need some sort of like action as an antidote to like all those, that young energy. And I think that that the Mishnah could be saying that like at that time I was kind of like, I was not in the best place. And if I would have tried to prove all these things, I might not have gotten there, but action real life was a good antidote to like all this, my inner life that was going on that was like on the other side of things. Uh, we spoke about Shammai, um, speak little, do a lot, accept everybody uh, in a pleasant way. Um, we spoke about this being, um, if you're very involved in Torah, like Sherry said, you're very connected. Um, you'll be connected, you'll be doing a lot and you'll also be able to greet people in a positive way. Um, and, I, and I offered another interpretation to this, whereas if you're really, um, the more you make, uh, the, oh, I, I, the tradition offered here was um, like, you should let the Torah guide you in terms of giving and, and like doing the right thing with other people. It's very tempting sometimes to just be like, get caught in petty calculations. Do it because the Torah is your kavua, it's guiding you. And then um, speak little, uh, but do much, like give in a proper way, don't hold back. And while you're doing that, um, try to do it in a positive way with a good countenance. Additionally, we had this Mishnah, which seems to be saying, do things in a diligent way. Don't cut corners. Uh, we also talked about um, how you pointing yourself a rabbi um, can help remove you from doubt. Sometimes people live, um, you should find a rabbi that's going to speak to your doubts. It's going to make you feel satisfied from their answers. And then if they say something you don't connect to in that moment, that's fine. But overall, find a rabbi that's going to remove you from doubt satisfy what you need and also don't rely on stringencies try to find when things are permitted it's okay to embrace them like our mordechai story um finally uh this mishnah we explained um about silence the value of silence um and that um and that oh we talked about also like with comes to being in groups that sometimes you need to speak up don't be only in silence sometimes it's good to speak up and when you're in groups around wise people and there's people suffering, 
uh, and, and people are in need, um, you can't be quiet. You have to speak up and try to get out of the theoretical and bring things down into action. So that's kind of like what we talked about.